Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our webinar. I'm Jeff Komar from Avid, and uh, very excited to have you here with us um, for the next hour or so. Um, super excited to really kind of dig into immersive audio with Dolby Atmos specifically for music, for jazz. Um, and uh, we've got a special guest with us uh, today that I'll introduce here in a second. Just kind of want to um, lay out a little bit of the um, uh, some of the basic information. We have some uh, other associates of mine from Avid on the line, um, certainly are able to feed questions into the, into the chat and um, we will, um, they can answer them directly in the chat. Otherwise, there's if something is um, more relevant to, to everybody, uh, we will actually field some of those uh, for Mark a little bit later in the in the presentation. Uh, so please feel free to interact um, with us. Um, just to kind of uh, my objective for this today is to kind of give a balanced uh, view of uh, not just the technology, but kind of the aesthetic and, and creative approach and really kind of want to leverage, really talk about, you know, how the technology serves the art. Uh, and so that's that's really want, what I want to split this between is, is a little bit of tech, a little bit of uh, aesthetics and really some practical information, too. There's a lot of people uh, I know all of us on our team are getting asked every day about, you know, want to start working in Dolby Atmos for music. And so it's it's coming up constantly. So so we're going to dig in. So so the first thing I want to do real quick here is just talk about uh, Avid's solutions. We've been doing this for quite a while and this started with theatrical with cinematic, uh, but we offer really comprehensive solutions for, for working in immersive audio. Um, and that is either putting together a very simple uh, Atmos rig or something very comprehensive uh, for larger workflows, including IOs and patching and monitoring and listening in multi-channel immersive, and then being able to manage and control all of those elements with an intelligent surface. Um, and um, certainly when you start working in immersive audio, it can be challenging. There can be a lot of a lot of pieces to manage and spatially placing a large number of, of, of elements, whether it's music or post, um, can be challenging. And we offer solutions from really essentially free with the Avid Control app, which runs on iOS or Android, all the way up to our flagship S6 uh, consoles, which are absolutely built from the ground up to really allow you to visualize and harness uh, immersive audio in Dolby Atmos. So, so just wanted to kind of lay out um, a little bit of the solutions. We're gonna talk some more as we kind of get into this about the technology, uh, but, uh, without further ado, uh, based in the north of London uh, and originally hailing from my my area in the Midwest, um, Mark uh, Gustafson is an independent engineer and producer who's worked on numerous uh, immersive audio projects in Dolby Atmos. Um, he's been working through lockdown actually to really focus on uh, recording and mixing in Dolby Atmos. Um, his latest project, which we're gonna actually look at some tracks from, uh, is uh, is a jazz quartet, uh, which is the uh, Carabaldus uh, Merriman uh, Quartet. And um, we're gonna take a look at that and some of the tracks that he's been working on. Um, he says that he's super excited about working in this format and kind of been recharged to, to really engage back into um, not just jazz, but a lot of other genres. Please uh, welcome uh, Mark Gustafson. Hello. Hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm well, how are you, Jeff? Awesome, thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, of course. Um, so just to kind of just to kind of kick it off, um, why don't you talk about uh, kind of what, how were you introduced to Dolby Atmos? What was the first thing that you were, uh, you know, kind of heard and really kind of started you on this journey? The thing that started me was uh, a band that wanted to do something more immersive and they wanted to write a project for that. And I think the original idea was that it was going to be for VR. And mm -hmm. the further and further we went down that, it was, well, now we have to get visuals involved and all, all of these things. It was like, we just want to make some music. And mm -hmm. Atmos seemed to be the ticket. So it, it started to, how, uh, how can I listen to as much as possible what material is out there? So Elton John, Rocket Man comes to mind. Amazing. Um, around the, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit deeper into that, um, the Pearl Jam record that, that came out. Um, mm -hmm. And they had visuals as well through Apple TV. So that was a really easy way to kind of uh, check it out and say, oh, I, I see how this could be used creatively, not just 
like Elton John, an up mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you are from the Midwest, which I'm from, <laughs> and uh, you spent a lot of time with Cheap Trick. So I wanted to uh, just briefly talk about your experience working on that orchestral uh, Dream Police concert. And also, I know they did a whole Sgt. Pepper's live thing. So what was your you know, kind of experience with that? Uh, I was the front of house orchestra. So I mixed with Bill Cozy, the, ba the band's front of house engineer. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was it was for an anniversary of of uh, Dream Police. So we did an entire the entire Dream Police record, giant video wall with a eighteen piece orchestra up uh, mm -hmm. above them, backup singers, incredible stuff. And we did uh, multiple runs in Milwaukee. Also did the Greek Theater, few spot awesome. shows here and there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, one of the last things I got to do was. Uh, the Sgt. Pepper show at Ravinia outside of Chicago. So it was yep. a really cool way to kind of, I got to play with every single one of their uh, large experiences like that. And they're just, you know, the best rock and roll band ever. So awesome. A lot of hometown pride, but uh, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I wanted to call out just uh, just briefly, we're going to uh, work with or take a look at some of these sessions that um, the last project that Mark just worked on again, which is this uh, jazz quartet. So just wanted to um, call up uh, out the both uh, the musicians, the performers, as well as the engineers and the studio owners. Um, this was done um, in a studio in St. Louis. Is that correct? Yes. Midtown Soundhouse beautiful space uh they had they have a wonderful tracking room api console all the outboard gear you could imagine lovely mic locker um and i was there to help them set up their b room to be an atmos rig so now they have an atmos set up and a mastering room so a really nice facility with a, a flat upstairs that i was actually able to stay at it was very comfortable <laughs> very cool so i want to i want to dig back into that in a little bit but before we get there sure. I want to talk about Atmos <laughs> and, and, you know, everybody's all now obviously really enthused about the creative potential and, and listening. And, you know, obviously there's loudspeakers and there's, and there's binaural and listening on AirPod pros. And, you know, obviously now that Apple's jumped into the pool, it's a whole different conversation. And, and um, so I guess my first question is, you know, uh, what, what was it that you, what do you find compelling, unique? Why did you jump into Atmos? And um, what is it about it that uh, you find compelling? Sure. I uh, like to stack things. I like um, kind of a uh, built up track by track wall of sound. So it's not wall of sound where you're all getting in a room and exploding it, but I, I tend to stack a lot, uh, but I lose a lot of definition and mm -hmm. you miss it. And, and as much as I like the soup of all of that, it's nice to know that all of these individual performances and all of these tones that we spent forever getting can be heard. And working mm -hmm. in Atmos was, it's just incredible to have Oh, well, there it is right there. It definitely adds to it. You can explode your own room. <laughs> you mm -hmm. recreate yeah. that. Uh, mm -hmm. But you have the definition and you get that depth for free. Things that you'd have to spend, what, three or four different processing chains just to get that, that depth that you get for free. Mm -hmm. You just place it and make it larger or smaller, closer or further. It's wonderful that way. Uh, it's incredibly flexible. Um, non-genre dependent, which I think is incredibly key. Um, mm -hmm. If it's going to be a widespread uh, delivery system, it has to kind of work for everyone. And I truly believe it does. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I like how well it translates system to system. Uh, it's always been the struggle, of course, that you have multiple monitors, small, big, boom box, whatever it would be just to make sure that it would translate and it never does really it's mm -hmm. kind of and you just try to do the lesser of any evils um sure. with atmos you can really hone it in and i could be in a very different room on a very different system and say yeah that sounds like my mix mm -hmm. you know yeah. to varying degrees of course but mm -hmm. i mean it sounds like my mix this sounds right and and i sure. really enjoy that aspect of it as well scalable awesome 
Excellent. Um, so, um, you know, kind of blue, just, I mean, it's an album that I've, I've heard a million times and then re-experienced it in Atmos. And, um, I think Steve Jenowick mixed it at Capitol and it's just a really, we'll kind of get back into some conversations about space, both real and, and artificial space, but, um, it's just, it's like this, you know, blanket of sound being wrapped around you. That's, it's just, it's fun to be in that space and listen to that. It's something you've heard a million times, but you're hearing it differently. So for right. me, that I think that's really unique. Getting a new, a fresh perspective on a record that already meant so much to you is is key. Kind of Blue does that. I, I think that a lot of the the Beatles uh, Atmos mixes do that as well. It's like, I know mm -hmm. every aspect of this, and yet this is new. I'm, I can enjoy this as a listener again, not dissecting all the little things and right yeah and i think we'll really come cool. back to that that concept about the art the aesthetic versus the technology right and you yeah. know certainly if we're mixing a major laser album or something we want to just do crazy stuff uh with elements and For moving sure. things then we can do that but hopefully you're making choices aesthetically that are appropriate for the genre appropriate for the for the musician to to really to you know to push the emotion and the and the appropriate nature of the of the of the art so exactly. um uh, so I just wanted to quickly just because there's going to be some text sprinkled in here, <laughs> but I, I wanted to just kind of say, you know, it doesn't we have a very wide range of how uh, you can start with Atmos and then how you can, you know, just really go crazy with it. I just wanted to say, basically, you can start with a laptop, Pro Tools Ultimate and, and Dolby Atmos Production Suite and literally a, a pair of headphones you, that you trust and start actually doing full Atmos. Um, and that is totally viable. And um, that's really kind of using the binaural renderer, um, but it's the start at working, you know, in this format. Um, so just kind of want to present that. And then we have to go to the other extreme because <laughs> that's what I like. That's what I like to do just to show that, yeah, we've been doing Atmos for a long time for theatrical and really massive workflows with lots of computers and matrix and all this kind of thing. So we can scale really massively, but I just want to show, you know, kind of the, a little bit about the, the span of, of where you can go with that. So um, I wanted to ask you, we kind of come to come back to the studio in St. Louis, uh, just about your experience. Um, I know you, you flew to St. Louis from London and you had to build a, a an environment that you could work in in immersive. And, and that sounds relatively simple, but not because you have to be able to trust what you're hearing in that environment. So just can you talk about briefly about setting up a rig in Midtown and something that you can trust and work work in in immersive audio? Sure. On the mixing end or on the tracking end? Um, let's, I mean, for, well, I, my perspective is kind of monitoring, being able to actually kind of yeah. hear, which, you know what I mean? If you're going to start actually thinking about things in, in, in 714 or whatever format you're working in, you have to be confident, right, to be able to listen to loudspeakers and headphones and that kind of thing. Yeah, so we, there, there is a little bit of blindness being in, in Studio One. And then studio two being the one that we we set up for there was a, uh, we tracked the first day so there was a lot of mm -hmm. we're doing this and you'll see why uh when we set up the room it was <laughs> uh measuring it's saying what's your loudness what is your preferred uh listening environment um mm -hmm. there was a lot of this is how you will actually tune the room um they were actually uh going through some further renovations the room was okay quite decently set up it was, it was a nice space to begin with mm -hmm. but that's the thing you can go through and tune further so it's it's knowing where are your speakers doing there was a lot of pre-planning so how far away are things um do you need any delays do you need any um major eqing or is it mm -hmm. really delicate do you even like that some sometimes mm -hmm. it's not even nice to have all that much. Yeah, sure. you might be making it more flat, but it's mm -hmm. um, that's not really what the curve is. It's what what feels comfortable to listen to. Sure. And so that so you had that a, a seven one four, you had a seven one four set of atoms right in the in the primary. Yeah, uh, I have seven four atoms uh, at at Midtown. They have uh, Dyn Audios. Okay. They went with Dyn Audios. I, I have atoms for my, for my setup here at home. Got it. Okay. So you have, a, you have a somewhat similar rig at home. Um, yeah. Also. yeah, that was, that was really comfortable. So being able to speak to the engineer for setup, as well as getting through this mix mm -hmm. process, it was, you know, we have very similar setups. It does this, 
and it translates incredibly well even though we're in massively different rooms they have a nice you know purpose-built studio and i'm in my front room <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can listen to loudspeakers, you can listen to binaural, you can yeah. do all of that, right? Okay. And spending awesome. a lot of time in binaural. I mean, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, most people will be listening to it that way. Sure. On AirPod Pros or, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I want to transition again a little bit into some a little more kind of concrete ideas. And because yeah again there's people that are starting and this could be some this can be kind of daunting and so i want to kind of start with a simple conversation about some of the elements that you recorded and then we're placing uh and i thought it would be just you know uh, one of the foundational elements obviously is is the acoustic bass it's an important part mm -hmm. of uh, and uh, just a disclaimer you're not you're not going to hear playback because we don't want you to hear playback <laughs> over zoom but the beauty of this <laughs> is in a couple of weeks we're actually going to have ac access to the sessions the actual print sessions sessions uh, in Atmos uh, that uh, uh, Mark has so kindly um, allowed uh, us to, to, to let you guys have uh, to work with to see what he did. Um, so uh, basically, my question is going to be this. Um, we've got uh, the session up. We we're looking at the renderer now. Um, and the question is simple. However, it is you have choices, you have aesthetic choices, you have creative choices, and this is a simple thing as, as, as a base that's placed in relatively center, right? But it is an object, it's not a bed, it is scaled a little bit, it's not totally on the front wall, there is additional sends like for LFE and things. So my question is, how do you navigate all of those levers <laughs> to kind of figure yeah. out where you're gonna place that element? And again, it is a foundational element, it's low frequency, you know what I mean? These are, I mean, it's not a, about the correct, it's not putting the levers in one particular direction, right? It's, it's, it's doing it, you know, aesthetically, so. Yeah, I, I think it, the discussion, because this was tracked live as well, a lot of those decisions uh, get made for you. <laughs> so where is this not competing? Where is this already, you know, there's going to be bleed. Uh, we couldn't even use um, the, the mm -hmm. uh, neck mic for anything except bass solos because it really just it, it wasn't pleasing at all so it, mm -hmm. it filters in and out but when you have the front to back in particular playing with the drums to the bass drums to the bass you just kind of flip back mm -hmm. and forth where is this speaking and not getting lost with the kick and snare it could end mm -hmm. up being very much like the the kick and the the snap of the snare. Well, that's my definition. That's my low end. Where is that? And mm -hmm. uh, it ended up being, I believe, that the drums ended up being slightly lifted in in many ways. And this could kind of just be that center stage, foundational, like a post, and everything else can mm -hmm. kind of be hung from it. Sure. Yeah. Um, and one thing to kind of reiterate that's kind of a, a thread throughout this whole project is, again, back to, you know, it, it's jazz, maybe similar to choral or classical music, and you're creating an image, sure. you're creating a space, right, to, for these instruments to live in. I guess, what is your objective on the project for how you want things, how that's how you want to paint that space? Yeah, I, I do enjoy that aspect of Atmos ultimately i mean of course as as you said it's really great when you have a project that requires um things spinning around your head and doing all these things those are awesome they are very very fun to listen to but it's mm -hmm. because the music itself requires it and you'd be doing sure. something approximating in stereo that would be that much movement and so on when you do have things that are still static i don't i don't think that that's any less pleasing i guess so just having this kind of depth this kind of mm -hmm. hug of sound and then the the ceiling and the the rears end up just kind of fe you feel it more and i, and I do mm -hmm. enjoy that aspect and that's hard to do when you're not looking at something uh in a straight line the band was not set up flat they were not on a stage sure. we were in a studio yeah. and people were all over the place and it was mm -hmm. how are these going to work together Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is how it just kind of the jigsaw ended up <laughs> snapping awesome. together. Can you talk a little bit more about the binaural? Because as you said, it's really important. And 
a lot of people are listening on AirPod Pros. And so yeah. just talk just briefly about, you know, you have to listen on loudspeakers and really, you know, how, whether you've got a 714 or 914 or 916, whatever you've got, you, you that's really the most precise way to, uh, to, to mix in Atmos. But then you've got to think about compatibility with the binaural. So how did you approach that and what decisions did you make? What did you change, uh, you know, as you're getting happy with the binaural mix? Sure. I. I spend a lot of time on headphones, um, not least of all because I am mixing quite a lot at home and I do have mm -hmm. neighbors and I try to be a good neighbor. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but also it's very important. I, I feel like I can make an awful lot of moves um, in the binaural renderer. I can say, I'm not audition something like a near, mid or a far and mm -hmm. I kind of know what that sounds like in my speakers. So there's a little bit of a, an advantage of that. I do know what it sounds like in my room. But sure. uh, throughout the mix, I do still flip back and forth um, when it comes to, to mix down. Uh, in particular with this, the, the other engineer, uh, Dan, Dan Merriman was crucial in this because we were sending each other MP4s back and forth. And it was mm -hmm. just, hey, what does this sound like on your AirPod Pros? Why don't you flip this on to, you know, plug this into your uh, sound bar? Or... Uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> and it, and yeah, it was yeah. this very collaborative thing just by sending an MP4 back and forth. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that has an awful lot to do with what's happening with the, the binaural renderer. Not as much yeah. for the Apple side of things is, is my understanding, but Mm -hmm. we still had a lot of changing of, do we want to keep something stereo? Do we want to split it into dual mono? Where are things yeah. going? What, right. what, where are we painting this? And yeah. mm -hmm. that has an awful lot to do with the binaural settings and a lot less sure. to do with the speakers. You can kind of get away with slightly more in the speakers. It kind of all sounds amazing. Yeah. And then sure. you can put on yeah. headphones and say, oh, well, that's not going to translate very well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So there's some QC that you can do by leveraging AirPod Pros or media server or soundbar, throw an MP4 over here, listen here, listen here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, very frequently. Cool. I'll, I'll print share to my phone, my phone. I can check on the soundbar. I can check on my headphones. And then I mm -hmm. will even make a further tweak. You can even get a, a client saying, why do I have mix test one point? four and you're like well the other <laughs> ones were not worth listening to i promise you but it's, it's kind of my own you know i've already gone through quite a lot of qc because this is how they're mm. going to listen to it but it didn't destroy anything on my end for a larger system you got it yeah um let's pivot a little bit into recording because um yeah. you know i think the tracks sound amazing especially the piano um th there's two tracks for space and time and then there's the blue dream but I think the piano is just marvelous in space and time. It just it's it just really sounds amazing, and it's just you're there. It's like you're literally sitting in the room watching her play. Um, so yeah, I mean, kudos to that. Um, but I guess talk a little bit about this again. It's back to the space for me, right? You're you've got some some traditional miking techniques, and you've got some blum lines, and but but then you're also doing some spatial stuff with ambisonics. Maybe talk about kind of uh, trying to capture the space and trying to represent the piano. Sure. I mean, with, with this type of recording, it does very much help with, you know, step one, have an amazing piano tuner. Uh, <laughs> step two, have an amazing pianist, <laughs> lovely mm -hmm. touch. Yeah. Yeah. And then step three, don't mess it up. Um, so we have very traditional things, but the way that those translate to Atmos is really excellent. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to have a lot of the Blum line in there in order to mm -hmm. fill in that gap. Um, but when it comes to something like Ambisonic, um, many of the songs we started tracking, it was in the middle of the room and it was kind mm -hmm. of acting more like a drum room mic. Um, mm. and when we came to, there's two tracks on this EP, which is out now. You can, you can listen to these final mixes as well on the on streaming platforms. But when mm -hmm. we came to two of them, they had large piano intros. And it was just, oh man, well, we have to, <laughs> this is a good time to change. So we, we set it up uh, kind of player's perspective overhead um, yeah. and giving, giving that kind of space behind that kind of you're sat at 
at the keyboard. You are the pianist. Gave a really lovely spread. There's something mm. about um, about pianos being recorded poorly. Uh, you can have traditional all day long if if it just kind of feels like the, here's a lot of these low ones and then it skips and you're in the upper register and mm -hmm. you miss this gap and having that fill in and and also give a backsplash to the wall that that meant a lot to it and you don't need a lot of it sometimes being very delicate mm -hmm. just bring it up until it just kind of sings again mm -hmm. she has the lovely touch all you have to do is say yeah. where is that moment that it felt like yeah. you might have been standing behind her when she performed it right yep yeah, very cool. Um, so I guess my, my next question is going to be about um, your approach to capturing. And and so, you know, I can tell and, and having talked with you, you're you know, you have some kind of some film scoring techniques um, and you're not just kind of approaching this as, you know, a traditional I'm going to capture everything the way I would normally do if I'm going to mix a stereo record. So I guess, sure. you know, what, what are, I mean, I'm presuming that, you know, some of these techniques kind of pay dividends at the back end when you're starting to place elements in space and thinking about Atmos and having the ability to take a 5.0, let's say from a double MS or, you know, make a 7.1.2 out of a, out of a quad from the ambisonic, like all these techniques you can then, you know, did you experiment with these uh, and then you keep experimenting on the next project? What, what's your approach? Yeah. Yeah, again, this this came very much out of that original idea of, oh, we'll do a VR project. And mm -hmm. so you're like, okay, we'll look into some of these things. And you're like, oh, this translates excellent to Atmos. So things like the ambisonic recording, um, that really, really helps. Uh, the double MS is, is really cool too. Of course, you don't have height, um, but there's a lot of things that that can be done to cheat that as well. I think it just comes down to if you have an excellent player why not get it for free now you know sure. mic it the way you know like, here it is stock this is a great mm -hmm. you know if we're going to rely on this room let's really capture that room and then you make mm -hmm. decisions um a little bit more like production uh what are what are you intending to be big what is meant to be roomy what is meant to be tight and sure. you act accordingly if it's not going to be in this session uh we wanted to try it out on drums and piano and the bass wasn't you know really meant to be picked up that way uh the mm -hmm. saxophone was really cornered off but that just led us to say well the saxophone could be really cool if we reamped it in the corridor and then yeah. use the <laughs> ambisonic microphone to pick it up so now we have this that's really cool this is a chamber that no one else has. Mm -hmm. This is midtown yeah. sound. This is just walking up, and it's just happenstance, right? This this is walking upstairs to the the mm -hmm. flat that I was staying in while I was here for the sessions. This this sounds yeah. great. We should we should track something here, and so you send it normally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Delayed it a bunch and send it in, and we're saying this was sectioned off so it could have its own space, but now the sax has a feature. It yeah. didn't, didn't get picked up on the, the tracking side, but it's now this feature where it has its own space that no one else shares. No one else got sent that, just the sax. Yeah, yeah. Those are the those are the types of techniques, creative recording techniques, I think, that are fantastic and, and often free, you know, uh, and, and don't require a whole bunch of fiddling with plugins and things like that, and often can res uh, yield better results than, you know, taking something and, and, and adding a bunch of, you know, uh, verb or, or ambience or delays or something to it after the fact. Um, Definitely, so and it's that's... unique. If, if you're in your practice area and you're used to listening to your band this way or... You're mm -hmm. at a club that you frequent and you're able to record something there, set up some extra mics in the back and mm -hmm. what, two, four mics pointed against the wall, all of a sudden you have what that ambience is and you just essentially put those in the rear wall. What does that yeah. sound like? Point some things yeah. to the ceiling. It doesn't have to be, you know, we, we had a, an incredibly nice mic locker to work from and I brought sure. some of my own mics. But, you know, grab some 57s or whatever you have. I'm sure yeah. that you can get creative with it and it will be unique. It will be your space. Right. Yeah. Um, 
I think you told me about kind of happy accidents with regard to um, uh, the mics that you put up that ended up being very useful for the sound of the drum kit. But I think weren't they initially kind of intended for something with the roads? Wasn't that the original kind of conversation or? Um... Sure. So with the roads, what we ended up with was something that was clean. So they had, uh, we put the amp in the, I don't know if you can see, just behind in this picture, there, there's a, an ISO booth. Um, ah, so mm -hmm. we had this area that now the sax was cornered off, the bass wasn't hitting too hard, and we had these extra room mics. And now mm -hmm. the drums were able to experience that. So when I'm saying like mic the rear wall, what we had was kind of an ambio square. And so we had this square of, I believe it, they were uh, bare dynamic uh, M160s, the, the hypercardioid ribbons. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were measured and balanced facing the piano. So it was catching the splash from the drums. We also then did have the ambisonic up. So you ended up with these, well, that's for free. You know, the mm -hmm. roads can live in its own <laughs> space because it was DI'd and had a mic in, in an ISO booth. Sure. Uh huh. But if you, you know, if you look at that project, when you open it up, it's just in the rear. You can see this square that of, of dots, square of dots. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You can see <laughs> the, the points where those <laughs> objects are in the yeah. rear mm -hmm. wall. That is just, that's, mm -hmm. that's just, for free you get you have that we yeah. didn't have to do as many um right. as many as much with the the reverbs or anything same thing with the mm -hmm. ceiling i believe there's some funky things happening with that uh in the ceiling that uh they didn't go where we expected them to go but mm -hmm. that's fine too you know as yeah long as it sounds yeah. nice um yeah so i think we were talking about a little bit of the drums and um I think you kind of got into got into that um, discussion. So, so here's my next like little segue. How are we doing? We're doing pretty good on time. Um, and I kind of <laughs> wanted to um, just uh, there's again the technology is the technology. The art is the art, and you don't have to use everything, right? You can use some artificial reverbs. You can certainly capture as much real space as you can. Um, there's beds, there's objects, there's, you know, object arrays or object beds. There's all kinds of different techniques if you scour YouTube and, and actually look at some of the guys that have been doing it for a very long time, um, you know, like uh, Greg Penny and Steve Genowick. Um, but um, there's a lot of, I, I think of them as building blocks and my kids have Legos, so I think in those terms. Um, how to pick the right tool for the right job. So for example, I mean, you're sending that base to extra LFE to, to kind of add some, some low end. Um, I know you're taking advantage of some special verbs like exponential and cinematic rooms, which are fun because they've got more precision in the Z, in the height, yeah. but you're also leveraging real stuff as well, right? We've been talking about a real acoustic space a lot. Uh, and then I think you're augmenting uh, the uh, uh, real space with uh, artificial or alg algorithmic space as well, right? Yes. And, and yeah, building those things together, you, you can have multiple spaces working together and saying, oh, I just want this elongated or this just needs to be special or I want a bit more distance. You can kind of get some of that with artificial and it's, yeah, it's just balancing. You can kind of get most of the way, bring up your uh, captured mic arrays up as far as you can. And as soon as it's, it's done its job, if you feel like you need more, put something else on it. That's fine. Just mm -hmm. layer layers and layers. Has your approach changed to how you deal with space and, and these types of, uh, elements from when you started from Atmos and kind of from where you're at now? Definitely. I, I definitely had, uh, much more of trying to cheat distance if it were uh, a singer's too close on a mic and I need a little bit of space or you know I'm not using as much of those short rooms in the same way that I did they, they certainly still exist but I feel mm -hmm. like I use many of the same tools to different effect and okay. it's just oh well this is how I'd normally use it but it's doing something different because there's already neutral room there's already for the binaural um, there's already kind of some of that stuff again I, I like to say you get it for free like I like the way yeah. this sounds I just move something I just pan it 
first before I, I affect anything. And sure. Well, it yeah. already sounds great. So what, how much more do I need? Um, mm -hmm. I think that it has made me a little less heavy handed. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been accused of that before. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's nice to kind of be able to say, oh, to taste. Um, and mm -hmm. I think my yeah. tastes have changed a little bit with that, mm -hmm. which is really yeah. interesting. Definitely. Um, I just wanted to kind of come put my tips hat on a little bit and just talk about, you know, everybody doesn't have to go out and buy cinematic rooms or, you know, Michael Carn's exponential reverbs, which are excellent. They're great. Right. But you don't have to have these, you know, special reverbs to do things in Atmos. There's, I just kind of wanted to, you know, uh, there's, there's certainly ways to leverage very inexpensive, excellent tools like, like the Valhalla stuff, uh, and, and place those multiple versions of those in different places, uh, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and that's, you know, kind of a more creative way in your template, uh, to, to deal with space as opposed to just saying, Hey, I hope I, I hope I get a seven one six out of this, you know, um, from, from one of those other tools. Definitely. I also think that it's, it's nice when you already have that taste. I already like this. I like using this Valhalla. I already like this, whatever mm -hmm. you could just be D verb, whatever it is. I like this and this is how I yeah. use it on my snare. Great. Well, yeah. How how exploded do you want that? Sometimes that's I need it mm -hmm. everywhere. Sometimes it's just I want it here and in the ceiling, and that's it. So it's half of the room. But right. you can play with it. Yeah. It it doesn't have to be something purpose built. It's just those two are really nice, and uh, I bought them. So yeah, no, they're they are not, they're incredible. They're both outstanding tools. Uh, but just kind of wanted to show other people. Other ways Definitely. to, you know, you can create a quad. If you've got a 714, you can create a quad bus and move things just in the Z space. You can, you know, put a, a low pass filter to darken up the, the rears, right? And there's all kinds of things you can do creatively that you don't just have to use one particular tool. I think that was kind of the point. Yeah. Um, and, and that layering idea. Layer. You, you can have multiple just like you would. You can use just whatever tools you have nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. they all sound mm -hmm. great yeah yeah absolutely with that said though there are some incredible tools out there uh <laughs> like 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 slapper from from cargo cult which is which is brilliant and it's a multi-channel delay and if you're looking for something really special that's one of those very special things um so uh i had to i had to have a slide about the hamasaki square hamasaki cube because it was so interesting and again it's it's back to the it's a back to the idea of i guess the question is thinking about atmos when you're when you're cutting when you're capturing right that's yeah. kind of i want to bring it back to that because again if you think about all these things when you're recording you have more possible creative things you can do right at the mix stage right yeah definitely uh in, in this particular instance, you have a jazz group playing live and they're not straight across. So Hamasaki Q becomes challenging <laughs> in that. So it doesn't become uh, very useful until you're capturing something that you can keep at the same time. If you are doing just the drums, that is a really interesting way to kind of capture your ambience. This is what this room sounds like. Um, and it's different. It does sound different to the Amazonic. It does mm -hmm. sound different to other methods. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't, uh, my philosophy is if you don't know what that sounds like, it's going to be very difficult to want to go to that place instinctively. It's like if this Amazonic mic is not doing the trick for whatever you're trying to capture, you have a choir, or, mm -hmm. you know, a string quartet that's being added to your metal track it doesn't matter what it is sure um, yeah yeah if you if you haven't heard it why would you know to go to it so it was very right, helpful right. for us to do that for a, a drum kit and to hear what that also sounded like as the piano room mic yeah but it again it comes from production so i, I do a lot of productions where we are thinking about what's going to be big in atmos what is going to be mono what is going to be singular sometimes we have multiple yeah. mics on a piano and sometimes in a pop track we're saying yeah that's just going to be a single point source there so we may as well mic it mono because that's all we sure. want yeah so choosing those a little bit in pre-production does go a long way it saves a lot of time because these arrays do take a bit to set up yeah yeah certainly excellent 
Um, okay, yeah, that's kind of more about the same conversation. But I, I think what we want to do, I, I've got more than I can deal with. <laughs> but I think what we want to do is engage some of the uh, people that have have uh, so kindly joined in and maybe ask some questions um, that are that are on here that um, I think would be um, worth uh, discussing. So let me just take a quick gander at um, um, looking at some questions. Um, okay, so. Uh, Dayton Warner asks, is it really necessary to have the same size monitors all around in Atmos, or do we just need L and R the same and LR, uh, the rears the same and the tops the same? What are your thoughts? I, I don't use all the same. Uh, I have all the same for uh, anything except the everything except for the front. So I have uh, eight, mm -hmm. the uh, what are they? A eight X, <laughs> and then the rest are the fives. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's pretty typical. I, I don't think that it's crucial. I mean, it's more crucial that you set it up properly, take the time to set it up properly, tune it. I think that's probably more important, and and listen to music in that space. Sure. Sure. Um, we talked, I mean, I know previously about kind of the importance of the LCR and really that foundational wall. Yeah. So I would say your LCR should probably be identical match speakers. Um, and I know in, in your case, that's a really important plane in, in the, in the Atmos environment, right? Definitely. I, I also find that, uh, I'm in need maybe of wides. Uh, I, I do very yeah. much like, and particularly with, with sure. a lot of the indie artists I work with, they, they mm -hmm. have these really interesting guitar parts that just getting just outside, it, it's that thing that you really try to master for, or mix for, trying to go just outside your speakers, that those mm -hmm. wides really do feel uh, great. And so, yeah, I, I would say that that would be the next step on, on, on my front because that's so important. It, it's less yeah. important to me that things always feel like they're flying over my head and that this mm -hmm. kind of curvature uh, feels good. Right. Yeah. So you're talking specifically about basically transitioning from the 714 to either the 914 or the 916 and the yeah. wides kind of come out and actually we can sh um, show a picture of that. But basically, yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of music mixers that um, well, not just music post as well that uh, for for score for 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 um, you know for the the score um, actually bringing the uh, musical elements out further you know, is is very very uh, is a great technique. Um, and it clears way for things like dialogue. It clears way for sound effects. You you have this clarity because no one's stepping on each other you can feel mm -hmm. it more um let's see here a couple more questions uh, uh hugo hernandez what monitor settings do you use to mix in your home after mixing at home you your mix modified or readjusted in a professional studio um i'm i just mix at home um i also have sound treatment up i do have everything tuned I do have 714 here at home, so it's it's mostly done here at home, and there are plenty of mixes uh, that have gone out directly from here to the outside world. Um, this is actually one of the few instances that it isn't. It has gone back and forth to St. Mm -hmm. Louis to, to get approval, which is amazing because then the band can approve uh, listening in a room. Um, sure. But no, I don't, I don't think it's necessary uh, but on a larger project, if you are having multiple tracks, uh, there should be some sort of a quality control stage. Um, mm -hmm. As you normally would, you can say, if you make everything at minus 18, then when you go back to listen to it, it will not have an album flow <laughs> because you don't have the the ride of the record. You don't have some tracks that are are more intimate and maybe quieter and then something that punches louder. It's just everything mm -hmm. is all over the place. Yeah. So minus 18 being kind of like a ceiling is more important. So if you can afford it, 
definitely get, uh, there are mastering engineers out there that are now doing that. And I would definitely recommend it, mm -hmm. but half two feels a little, a little much for me. Yeah. Yeah. So Brian Montgomery, how do your clients listen to your mix to approve it? What format do you send and do they need special hardware to listen to it? Is there a way to send them a binaural mix for approval? Yeah, I used to send uh, a stereo and a binaural. Um, and I've kind of done away with that since Apple has done spatial audio. Um, mm -hmm. I have sent now more uh, the MP4 and um, just kind of say, please listen on headphones. If you have a sound bar that's almost mm -hmm. compatible, this is how you can do that. Um, you know, certainly if you have an iPhone, it, a little bit becomes a bit of a tutorial in your email. Here's this new mix. Here's a bunch of things. <laughs> but if you don't give them right. the information, then you you can't expect someone to have um, detailed notes. So it's a bit of a challenge. Um, but, you know, again, if not everyone is quite at the stage where uh, you're listening on even sound bars, the headphone mix is still excellent. And that seems to be the middle ground is the MP4. It gives a good mm -hmm. and accurate representation. I've gotten decent notes from that. So a little bit more into the binaural, and I know Apple has a slightly different kind of take on that. I think Alex from YouTube is asking, uh, since Apple ignores the binaural settings from the mix session and creates its own 514 specialized sound, what binaural settings from the mix session translate over to Apple's spatial audio? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I can speak to exactly the technical, if it's full, I'm not listening to the uh, binaural settings at all, but I do think that there is a difference, uh, but that's kind of why I use the MP4, because that, that really does seem to be incredibly similar, if not exact, <laughs> to what, what I'm hearing yeah. out of my soundbar, having now... Uh, mp4s of things that are already released so i'm able to listen mm -hmm. to an artist i've already worked with and say that's what it sounds like already streaming and here is the mp4 of the exact same file you're like okay i i, I can see it mm -hmm. so does it make for some challenges when you're doing something in the minutiae saying this is far this is near yeah a little bit but mm -hmm. again lesser of all evils if you can kind of make sure that it sounds great on your binaural playback um you know in my case it's through dad man listening to headphones and then i have an export to my phone and then i listen on my airpod pros mm -hmm. as long as it's not wildly off uh, i tend to then just keep it that's a good good point to start sending clients got it um Alexander Mullis asks, is phase polarity alignment crucial in Atmos mixing? Does it make a bigger difference than stereo polarity? I don't know bigger difference, but um, I think polarity and phase relationships are important generally. <laughs> so is it when you're talking about mi microphone arrays? Absolutely. Um, yeah. But I mean, you don't want you don't want that anyway, right? It, it, nine times out of ten, your uh, kick, snare, and your bass and your vocal are all going to occupy some sort of a space. If you have two mics on the bass, you're going to want that to be in in polarity. You want them to also then be in phase with each other. So, sure. Yeah, I don't know if more necessary. Actually, I think you could probably cheat it a little bit more. <laughs> you can got to get away with more. Um, mm -hmm by placing it so far away from things, but yeah, I think it's, it's worth yeah. the effort. Here's a, here's a good question. That's um, just useful <laughs> uh, with Atmos mixes. Is, is there a method for what goes where in terms of outputs or it's just a choice? For outputs, I, I imagine that's the binaural renderer. No, I, th I think my t my interpretation of his question is really, how do I know where to put stuff? <laughs> and so what I was going to ask you is, should I put the acoustic bass in the center of the room right. at the full height? <laughs> Get, give it a go. <laughs> Have a listen and then say, yeah, maybe I won't put that there. Um, I, I'm going like to approach, take it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to approach my mixes by first starting to pan things. 
Um, mm -hmm. Drastic panning can be fun, but start start moving subtly first and find yeah. where things are. It it's usually you're dealing with this kind of front curve. I go to about 66 where things are are kind of feeling like it's just around the bend and everything feels mm -hmm. great to me. Um, and then mm -hmm. sometimes it's drastic, but to me, it has more to do with the height. You go until you say, all right, it's falling apart. And then you bring it to where it sounds good. Now you can start EQing, compressing, doing anything that you, you need to. And yeah, is there a reason to put an acoustic bass in the ceiling? I don't see why, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, have a, have a John, method to the madness if you can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you're doing a lot of listening um, in binaural um, on your system at home, I guess John Crossley asks, what would you say the best headphones for mixing are on are? And is that the answer is just whatever you're comfortable with, right? Yeah, I would say the ones you know. Um, if you're mm -hmm. if you're comfortable with a certain set of headphones, don't throw a new headphone into the curve as well. You already have the renderer and how things sound in Atmos to worry about. You definitely don't need. Yeah. And then I have to get used to these new headphones, expensive or or cheap. It doesn't matter. It's new. Yeah. Yeah. Another, and I, this actually, this is um, fortuitous, but the, the re-renders, right? Um, basically, the, one of the cool things about that, this format is the idea of, you know, kind of intelligent re-rendering re or recomputation uh, of the master mix into different flavors. So it's, this is showing like a, a binaural, a 5.1, a 7.1, 7.1.4, a stereo. And you can listen to all of those flavors. Do you ever listen to the 5.1? um for example in in a project yeah definitely uh i flip i flip between the binaural the stereo uh usually the seven one don't know why that just tends to be the thing maybe it's just because my layout is a seven one um but yeah mm -hmm. it becomes the physical and then those those other things i tend to mix for atmos and then deliver something even if somebody says i have this stereo project I'm still mixing it in Atmos, and then yeah. uh, here's the stereo re-render. And obviously, if that's the mix that they are most concerned with, better sound good in stereo as well. So yeah, a lot of monitoring. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But that, so that are will you also thinking... help with the scalability as well. If if somebody doesn't have as many speakers as that, just knowing that things fold down in in many ways definitely helps. Right. So is every new project that you take on, are you thinking about Atmos, even if they're just initially thinking about putting it into a stereo domain? Definitely. Uh, I think there's only been two, maybe two mixes, like a, a <laughs> Christmas compilation. You know, somebody had done mm -hmm. something for a last minute uh, charity single that it was like, okay, we, we got to just do this really quick. That was done in stereo and I want to say that there was something else but everything else i've done in the last year and a half at least has all been at most whether they asked for it or not sure awesome because i like mixing in it <laughs> i find it to be more <laughs> creative so i'm gonna do it because i'll get to the end of my day sooner and be pleased with my product even if it's stereo. hey that's that's cool i mean um that's awesome um i also don't uh, fancy somebody coming back and saying Oh, I really want this in Atmos, and being like, oh, I gotta redo this. <laughs> now we'll have to scale it. Be like, no, I already made those decisions. Here you go. <laughs> Here's your ADM. Right. Go for it. Uh, there's a question that came in. Uh, what about loudness when you mix or master immersive audio? Is the standard the same as mixing and mastering in stereo? Um, I try to do as much um, monitoring, loudness monitoring. I mean, checking for minus eighteen um while i'm mixing uh but then yeah there is a process at the end that is okay what is meant to be the loudest track i'll keep that mm -hmm. one at the at as loud as it can be um without breaking rules uh don't need anything sent back saying i can't distribute uh and then i find what what goes underneath that and then i just play with vcas until the record feels like the right flow mm -hmm. I mean, even though everyone's here's a, here's, just going to listen to whatever single, but records sure. may mean something to me. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, back to the the you know, there's no there's no rule book for Atmos. Um, Barry Rudolph sure. asks is is using only the LFE and only objects for the rest uh, a viable approach for Atmos music mixing. And I know there's a lot of different schools of thought here uh, about you know objects, object beds, and then hey, I'm just going to use the, the the LFE channel from the primary bed and I, there's a lot of different approaches. So tell us what you what your take is. Yeah, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to approach that. I think that if you feel like the object bed works for you, then go for it. Absolutely. And if you have a very mm -hmm. good reason for that, absolutely, you should do that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I just don't fully understand the object bed or what, what that is, but I, I do use the bed. Um, I even use an effects bed, which just kind of spawned out of showing somebody else that happened to be in the room that's in more of a, a post-production. It's like, yeah, you can set up multiple beds and this is how you do it. Um, mm -hmm. And then it just kind of stayed in the session, uh, but it's kind of nice. It's like, oh, here, this is where these go. And I still need objects mm -hmm. for some of the ceiling things um, sure. for, for cinematic rooms and things like that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I use the bed, but I do filter my LFE. I don't just send the LFE, I do filter it. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I, I feel like that's that's just what I've kind of stumbled upon and it's always changing. You know, in two months time, I might say, oh, object bed, my brain is, it's, it's exploding <laughs> with ideas because I don't know, I, you know, it's always changing and my my templates are all over the place. If I opened up one from last year, I would say, why did I do it that way? So I think that's, I mean, my opinion, and not that anybody asked, but I love experimentation. Ask, what is your I, opinion, I, Jeff? <laughs> well, no, I, I like, I think this, the, where we're at in Atmos music right now is a little bit of a wild, wild west, but that's kind of fun uh, because there is not one right answer and there's different approaches and people are sharing mixes and sharing ideas and, and it's, it's an exploratory, yeah. it's a journey. I, I think that's really cool personally. Um, since you asked, Mark. <laughs> yes. And engineers and artists alike uh, are sharing that. And the artist might not come at it from a technical perspective, but I, I work with an art pop band, Yes Factory, that is like, how oh, can we do this drum circle with an ambisonic mic? And can we do this? And I'm like, let's try to break it. I don't know. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't see why not. Uh, we can try that, you know, to, to your to your point of putting a base in the ceiling. Yeah, we'll do it. I don't, <laughs> don't know why we do that. And like, oh, that sounds terrible. Like, yeah, I know, but we tried it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, a couple last questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here. Uh, Keenan asks, how do your Atmos mixes translate in stereo? I, I hope, well. Uh, I, as I, as I do monitor it quite frequently, um, it, it is a little strange to listen to it without bus processing. Uh, haven't mm -hmm. really cracked that yet from, for my personal workflow. Um, mm -hmm. so it is kind of like, does this sound good in stereo knowing that I'm going to be putting some mixed bus processing on it? Um, because mm -hmm. it's not always applicable. Uh, you know, you, you do want a different curve maybe. Uh, typically, I just need I need a little bit more high end. I need a little bit more of this, a um, little bit of compression for excitement. I get a lot of excitement and dynamics out of Atmos, but when it folds down to stereo, I, I kind of want to recoup some of that. So I hope it sounds yeah. good. Um, certainly, mm -hmm. this this project it is out right now. So listen to it in Atmos, and um, yeah. uh, Dan Dan Merman he he mastered it as well. It is the stereo re render of the the project so you tell me how does it translate i hope i hope well <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah awesome well we really appreciate you spending some time with us um we of just kind of want to bring everything back to you know it's it's all about the music it's it they're, they're creative tools we have a whole bunch of technology but it's really in service of of the music and so try some things experiment work with some other people um you know kind of again share mp4s and um and and think about atmos when you're recording 
Think about Atmos, not just when you're mixing, when you've got a bunch of mono and stereo things, you now need to Atmosify. You know, it's great to repurpose a catalog, but it's also it's better to even think about it at the stage where you've got, you know, modular synths and you've got microphone arrays, and then you, you have so many more, you know, creative options when you actually get to mixing. Um, so uh, we want to take more- tracking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just mean to say, um, you know, like I, I'm, I've been enjoying a lot of production. We're starting from scratch saying, I have this yeah. little acoustic idea. What are we going to do in Atmos with it? And so we start sure. building these tracks based on that for another mm -hmm. time, I suspect. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you to Mark very much for hanging out with us, with us and thank you to everybody that stopped by. And uh, stay tuned. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have access to uh, not only the recording of this, but access to the actual print sessions from both of those two tracks. So um, on, my, on behalf of myself and Avid, thanks very much.